Welcome to this uh, party. I hope you are enjoying the conference and that you feel energized by everything you hear. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, chair this uh, Baptist lecture. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sagita Bhagagupta from the Department of Language and Aesthetic Learning, having to chair at the School of Educational Communication at the University of Linköping. Again, Shopee, sorry. That was a, a non Um uh, Sagita uh, has an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary background. Once, quite some time ago, she was a PhD student at a graduate school of communication studies in, uh, at Linköping University, and uh, she wrote a dissertation about an organization in India called the Mobile Krishis, and they provide they cater to the needs of children of migrant laborers in the construction industry, as the parrots move around. And uh, what's interesting about this organization is that it also provides uh, the women who work there with uh, training, academic training, literacy training, and participation in uh, various types of activities such as fundraising and so on. So the organization is both caring for children, but at the same time an educational activity in itself. Uh, after finishing her thesis in the uh, mid-90s, uh, Sangeeta engaged in various kinds of projects. She allowed them to do the postdoc period at the Government University at Washington, D.C. Uh, when she came back, she moved to Oberbrug uh, University, which was uh, and was still sat at the center of Sweden where she worked at the Department of Education and since 2016 in 2016 in, in Swedish uh, she works at the um, University of the Shopping University in the School of uh, Education and Communication and her research interests are, as you may guess, trolling our dissertation here in culture, communication, languages and diversity and uh, she has worked in many projects uh, uh, and she has a very broad international uh, repertoire of activities. You know, but when you contact her, you never know where she is physically, but that doesn't matter nowadays, as you know. And she, can, uh, she also has an interest in, in, uh, in uh, ethnographic types of work and the methodological issues that concern ethnographic types of work, and then she has a very strong interest in the logic of science, so how, in what way is science research itself colonialized, colonialized by ideas that may not be invisible. So decolonization is one of her, um, of her main interests. She's also a very uh, versatile person. She not only speaks several languages, but uh, she's, also, she's also multilingual in sign with languages, which are focused on such so a common uh, uh, activity. After her uh, dissertation, she was also awarded a uh, um, very prestigious postdoc for future le leaders and uh, female leaders in academia by the Swedish Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, and uh, after her, uh, she has also had to work as that as one of the institutes established research groups that work with these specific issues of cultural communication and. Uh, diversity and she has won several grants from various Swedish and international funding agencies. She's also an experienced supervisor, a PhD supervisor herself. Uh, today she will speak on the necessity of major minor seeing them during the educational sciences. So you will get a, a, a lecture in Swedish. Seeing them that is a word which is not very frequent in the Swedish language, I can assure you, but it's very interesting and it has poetic qualities. So, Sangeeta, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those kind words, Roger. It's not uh, every day that you get to have your former supervisor and continuing mentor to introduce you and not at early. Um, Petri Mekinen, a student in the course on individuals in a one school for all at a university in Sweden in the 1990s, 
often challenged his seminar member Israelis out of the box questions and comments. Petri always seemed well prepared with the course readings and he often had tips about other literature and radio programs in our pre-digital existence. In 2001, when Petri published a book about his lived experiences and trajectories across time spaces, from his birth in Sweden in 1967, a year after his parents and four siblings had migrated from Finland to improve their life prospects, his entangled life in and across medical and educational institutions as different experts tried to fix his body and his thinking, to his studies and professional life as a psychotherapist and researcher in social work. Here is a translated excerpt from Petri's gripping book, Exist, the Vision of the Blind. It is a reality that I sit in a wheelchair and am blind, and I have to accept the fact that when people describe me, they say, yeah, Petri, yeah, he's the guy in the wheelchair who's blind. There is a risk that I will have my personality completely judged against the background of my disabilities and the negative prejudices that come along with them. What other people think of you is largely determined by a fleeting first impression and by the evaluating person's own needs. However, the risk of being judged more categorically than otherwise is obviously greater if you have clear external sounds of deviation. End quote. My introduction of Petri as a university student, or Petri's experience of his interlocutor's singular focus on his functionality, illustrates, among other things, the work that language does in position in a person. Languaging, the doing of language, plays a key role in creating our worlds. Petri's reflection on being boxed into the position of the guy in the wheelchair who is blind is symptomatic of mainstream languaging that people fall back on when they see someone sitting in a wheelchair, or someone with dark glasses, or someone with a cane in the hands. Here, it is interesting to note that Petri is not boxed in the positionality of a migrant whose parents and siblings had moved across nation state boundaries in search of a better life. The label migrant is not a relevant marker for people around him. Perhaps his family's white positionality and their migration from another Nordic nation state make the label irrelevant. This is, in fact, how the National Authority Statistics Sweden reasons when it tabulates demographic figures for the inflow and outflow of human beings from Sweden. Citizens from the Nordic countries who migrate to Sweden are often excluded from the group labeled as migrants. While this is important in itself, what is interesting for our purposes today are the conundrums the problems in the educational sciences, including in teacher education, where we boss in people based on selected characteristics, despite their intersectional complexities. Petri is positioned in fixed boxes by others, despite his dynamic intersectional complexities. Our scholarship is boxed in, or is fractured, based on a focus sometimes on dimensions like functionality, gender, age, language, sometimes on nation state, religion, or cultural belongings, sometimes on subject areas. Thus we become experts in special education, a specific disability, gender, multiculturalism. We become experts in technologies, media, mathematics, literature, language, multilingualism, including areas like writing, reading, or assessment, variation, democracy, or even the early or middle or later school years of adult learning. Let me take a second illustration to hone in my point here. When we look at this representation of our homeland, 
We don't see any boundaries that separate nation states from one another. We see demarcations that represent land and water. We may never question the forces that collate to create nation state boundaries. Not until there is a conflict and new boundaries create bigger, smaller, or new nation states. We perhaps notice that this map is different from what we are accustomed to. We may even consider it to be upside down. We can probably live harmonious lives without ever questioning why some places on our spherical moving planet are called West and East, or why we call it some North and South. World maps made by humans have boundaries and directionalities. Terms like the Global North and the Global South that have become popular mark colonizers or the rich and the colonized or poor geographies on the planet. Recent and emerging conceptualizations in decolonial scholarship draw traction from anti-colonial, southern and post-colonial epistemologies, calling attention to the need to go beyond the geographies of Northwest versus Southeast. As Gulminda Brahma, Walter Mignolo and others have argued, the Global South or East, or the majority, the Global North or West or Empire, and Southern or Northern constitute vocabularies that point importantly to ideas, in addition to territories and human beings who have been marginalized at best and erased at worst from the grand narratives of North-centric enlightenment and modernity. The geographies of the South or East literally map onto the new worlds that Europe claimed to have discovered, appropriated and colonized since at least the 15th century, and whose peoples it continues to colonize economically, culturally and intellectually. The salient point here is that labels we use for things or people like Petri, you and me, or nation states like Finland and Sweden, or planetary directionality are value laden, they are not neutral. Here it becomes relevant to ask, who gets to decide what is what? What is relevant knowledge of concern to different areas of human existence, and more importantly, within the scholarship? With these illustrations as initial points of departure, my talk tries to complexify key issues and notions of relevance for different domains of the contemporary, multidisciplinary, multi-domain educational sciences. I analytically argue that the key issues and notions related to identity positionalities, human communication, equity, and what we gloss as cultural learning cannot be sidelined irrespective of which early SIG we are members of. Thus, I invite us to take a curiosity-driven creative stance towards issues related to communication, culture, and diversity against the backdrop of learning and instruction in terms of their emergent fluid nature, as opposed to their boxed in, static, taken for granted status. The central argument I am pushing today is that issues related to identity, communication, equity, and culture have become fossilized and naturalized in the contemporary mainstream of the education and sciences. This has consequences for the very sustainability of knowledge production, or in other words, system epistemic sustainability. Epistemic sustainability builds on the normalcy of complexity. Drawing on the Swedish term sin vendor and building on a mobile gaze, epistemic sustainability requires a troubling of the universalizing agendas in research and education and draws attention to the need for multiversal frameworks. Doing this requires, I argue, unlearning in order to relearn. The rest of my talk is organized in three sections. Based on the contemporary challenges humanity and our planet faces and the need for what is being called undisciplinary or indisciplinary, the first section argues for the relevance of bringing center stage southern thinking into the realm of the educational sciences. Section two 
more explicitly troubles the mainstream universalizing nature of the educational sciences, indicating how key concepts unwittingly risk becoming outsourced. It is here that multiversality becomes crucial as global-centric rather than naturalized north-centric points of departure. In the final summarizing section, I will draw attention to hopeful scenarios that a curiosity-driven creative stance can open up practically. Here I will highlight five major and minor inventor that are needed to revitalize and make the education and sciences meaningful. <coughs> The contemporary human condition is marked by planetary challenges such as the ongoing war. Near Europe, wars and instability in other parts of our planet, the climate crisis, increasing political polarizations, racism and fascism, growing economic disparities and other marginalizations. Digitalization exasperates these challenges by bringing them directly to our analog doorsteps and lives. Techno technological innovations paradoxically hide in a sense of despair and importantly dispel illusions of linear societal developments. Another salient issue is a growing realization that mainstream research does not improve or safeguard us from the challenges that mark our contemporary existence. In this scenario, we cannot continue to ignore the multiple crisis faced by K-12 schooling, higher education and scholarly publishing, when more and more people around the world across all ages are participating in educational institutions whose relevance is seriously questioned and more and more is being published but of questionable relevance for societal challenges. Mark Salveson, Mulefike Piasante, Monica Hiller, Kimbrut Piller, and other scholars across northern and southern territories are drawing attention to the restricted nature of what is being taught and published by whom, for whom, for what purpose, with what guiding ontologies and epistemologies. Timingwald, for instance, says, and I quote, Scholarship has been virtually relegated to the dustbin of academic work that is practically useless a drain on the public purse and destined for obscurity in the land of academia. Curiosity has been divorced from care, freedom from responsibility, end quote. We also need to remind ourselves that despite recurring record temperatures, fires and rainfall and other quirky ways that nature is conducting itself across the planet, many people align with conspiration theories and ideological facts. It is highly problematic that science is not taken seriously at a point in history where an urgent need for collective action exists. Unlike during the pandemic when biomedical scientists, governments and industry collectively innovated to produce multiple vaccines to bring the world back on its feet, we rarely collaborate for the common good and instead focus on short-term territorially defined benefits. Here, an ancient term, Jugad, is relevant. Jugad thinking builds on an openness and flexibility to learn, to unlearn with the aim of free learning. Jugad has been explicated as a frugal, flexible, inclusive innovation that, like the creation of pandemic vaccines, is crucial for small or large-scale issues. Jaydeep Prabhu discusses Jugad as, and I quote, the cutting and pasting of existing off-the-shelf solutions applied to a pro quality product that is viable across territories, end quote. Replacing what was previously acknowledged as mainstream valid knowledge through adaptation and flexibility in areas as diverse as leadership, design principles, provision of education and healthcare to marginalized rural and transient communities seem to have gained from Jugad applications across the planet. While innovative collaboration produced COVID vaccines in record times, nation states in Europe and other Northern Territories purchased multiple vaccine doses for their own populations. 
Despite the knowledge that vaccines, unlike human bodies, do not follow naturalized logics of body regimes. Viruses and other non-humans do not recognize created demarcations between nation states anywhere on the planet. Building on an equity-relevant agenda, epistemic sustainability assumes and includes other prefixed sustainabilities that have become popular following the declaration of UN's Agenda 2030. Standing on the banks of the Mediterranean during the 16th Holy Conference in Limassol in 2015, some of my doctoral students and I wondered, did I think some of them are here? That tourists on board the cruise ship we saw before us were experiencing. Given the regular news bulletins of the seemingly unending wars, fleeing refugees were losing to cross the Mediterranean. Death tolls were high. The picture of the popular Alan Kurdi, whose body washed ashore three days after the early conference ended, would go on to shape the world. Eight years later, the 20th early conference is back in the Mediterranean coastline. Despite further restrictions and an increasing right wing neo Nazi revival, a mere seven decades after the end of the war in Europe, that we have learned to label the Second World War. Refugee boats continue to ply humans across the Mediterranean waters. Bodies continue to wash ashore on European shores. These are the same territories to which tourists from all over Europe and the rich from other continents travel to for their annual vacations. Such drownings are not a new feature or a unique plight in this continent. They are a legacy of colonialism. A historical static gazing at what was and is transpiring on the Mediterranean leads to short term inhuman responses and a silence from the privileged. A key issue here is how we scholars respond to these challenges. Our mainstream epistemological work seems to be conducted with blinders that shield us from these contemporary and historically marked tragedies that continue to unfold in our backwaters. The drownings of humans in search for a worthy life in contemporary European territories is something we rarely address despite our commitment to democracy and an equitable communication, education for all. In sharp contrast, some epistemologies have emerged in the works of philosophers and humanists based on the very suffering of both refugees in other parts of our planet. These scholars and thinkers could not, did not, turn their gaze away from what was unfolding in their backwaters. For instance, Zen master Thita Panel's pedagogical work across the planet was based on his initial defiance of the Vietnamese authorities, who, like the Europe of 21st century, were allowing boat people to perish on the seas of its long coastline. His thinking and actions also defied mainstream practices of Buddhism in response to the atrocities and sufferings in the aftermath of the American invasion of Vietnamese territories. It is symptomatic of our mainstream single grant narrative that we label Thich Pan's writings and philosophical offerings as religion, while our West Euro North America centric work is labeled science. Events recently launched by different sectors in Sweden aimed to, and I quote, invigorate the cultural, creative, and industrial sectors and create new ways of collaboration for a common sustainable existence through European and global cooperation, end quote. Framed in terms of the planetary threat to humankind, the initiative's website says that we human beings need to take responsibility and change our systems and ways of living. We need to pull all our vulnerabilities and creativity to create and apply new solutions. But this will not suffice. We also need to transform on an existential level and reconnect with ourselves the living planet, our past, present, and future. 
Therein lies the pursuit of meaning, purpose, and belonging. We call that reconnecting process existential sustainability. Two analytical issues can be raised from such formulations to illustrate the issues that I'm drawing our attention to. Firstly, how is it that the cultural, creative, and industrial sectors are taking the lead in such innovative collaboration rather than academia? Secondly, and more critically, who is the we that is speaking here? Which peoples and groups are being spoken for and by whom? While Southern knowledges and philosophies build on the importance of living in harmony with nature and the planet in sustainable ways, the we here both erases and co opts these epistemologies. Using such initiatives as symptomatic of an added problem where mainstream or Western or Northern knowledge in the singular has neither taken lead nor made a difference, what I am drawing our collective attention to are the increasing calls for decolonizing our very thinking. It is the very systems of thinking as decolonial scholars situated across northern and southern territories put it, that make themselves, that themselves need rethinking. Such work spotlights Afrocentrism, Asia Commons, indigenous thinking in, in historical frameworks by counteracting what Adam Getachew calls the symphony of Eurasia that has obscured and denied contributions of Southern epistemologies to humanity's contemporary existence. Recentering contributions of civilizations and knowledges from across the planet is seen as argumenting the singular knowledge regime that is imagined to have emerged in isolation in territories of West Europe. Such coins highlight the universalizing nature of what we mean by science and how knowledge production should be carried out. Scholars within sociology, anthropology, and the language sciences have centrally started recognizing and attending to these challenges. While the education and sciences have a pivotal role to play here, its efforts lie in our future work. The erasures and co-opting of multiple knowledges can be illustrated by the analytical framings that feed into what we today call trans methods. These build on what has existed for a long time in indigenous methodological framings, where data is understood as an active process and where its partial, created nature is recognized. Even when we are inspired by trans methods of and become curious about indigenous ways with data, our interests regarding people and communities, language and culture become reduced to tangible products through datafication. Thus, the increasingly popular trans and post method framings in mainstream social sciences and humanities continue to fall back on connecting rather than co creating data. Extracting from and often without acknowledging these existing othered epistemologies seriously jeopardizes the validity and relevance of our research. These challenges relate in key ways to what it means to be human in contemporary times. How we organize learning for the young and old in institutional settings in times of uncertainties are related to central ways to areas that have lost its identity, diversity, culture, and human communication. Working in these areas in siloed disciplinary on domain-specific terms is in opposition to what knowledge production needs to invest in if we are to make our work relevant to what is transpiring around us. Thus, while we carry on our business of researching, disseminating our findings of conferences and other scientific engagements, we need to pause and ask, in what ways the education and sciences research is multiversal, and how, if at all, it connects with societal challenges? What are the ways in which we ourselves unwittingly become co-opted in the business of education and research that reduces learning and publishing to economic units. Here, giving up intimacy with one's discipline becomes an important aspect of what some flag as un- or indisciplinary science. Living with the discomfort of letting go of the safety of one's research domain, 
Stefan Swalforsch, a privileged white male able-bodied senior scholar, highlights the importance of being on the edge rather than in the mainstream in his 2020 <coughs> autoethnographically framed volume, The Inner World of Research on Academic Labor. Swanforsch says that he has recently started to think that he should, and I quote, stay on the edge, not let myself get sucked in, retain that distance, because proximity to the frigid sun of the center blinds more than it illuminates, that I should nurture my marginality, end quote. Situating oneself as a scholar in border spaces rather than the proximity of the center is critical to doing science that has relevance to contemporary challenges. It is at the edge or in border spaces that we can nurture a mobile gaze that can set aside disciplinary or domain specific taking for grantedness. It is in such spaces that open creative thinking can be nurtured. Here an engagement with global centric epistemologies rather than the naturalized, universal, north-centric, or for that matter, south-centric knowledge regimes is key. With that, we move to the second part of my talk. Two further imaginaries mark the naturalization of north-centric superiority thinking and contribute to its universal and universalizing framing. The fantasy of linear knowledge development and the idea that contemporary mainstream education can rectify historically framed injustices in local, regional, and global settings. Complexities of human existence, complexities of human existence and its multiversality call instead for a web-connected knowledge production metaphor. It is this that Sanjay Subramanian, Gurminda Pramundra, and others call connected histories. Thus, mainstream science needs to become curious about the thinking of people and scholars outside spaces of empire and what the practical implications of these knowledge issues can be. Multiversal thinking pushes for reconsidering the meta language we fall back upon in our scientific work. The far from adequate naturalized meta language, the key vocabularies and the taken for granted ways of conducting research call for, in Sintri Makoni's words, tracing back the archaeology of mainstream West Euro North America centric thinking itself. In his 2022 volume, The Decolonizing the Mind, a guide to decolonial theory and practice, Sandu Hira critically argues for the need to attend to epistemology, that is the theory of knowledge, through a multiversal lens. His central point is that, and I quote, epistemology is the manipulation of the mind through the knowledge production itself, end quote. This means that what we believe what knowledge is provides us with guidelines about what is valid and what is worth knowing. Our beliefs about the validity of knowledge helps us sort between what is true and false, what is right and wrong, and this guides what we do in science to produce knowledge. Using the example of Christopher Columbus to explore the nature of valid knowledge, Hira asks whether Columbus was a hero or a criminal. In Eurocentric historiography, Columbus was a scientist, an explorer, a discoverer. The world should honor his contribution to science and progress, and the colonized world does. Because there are more than 600 statues erected across the globe in tribute to Columbus. In decolonial historiography, Columbus is a criminal, the one who opened the door to genocide and enslavement of the indigenous people of Abia Yala and the European enslavement of Africans. The 600 statues should be brought down and destroyed, and his crimes should be exposed in the textbooks of the history of the world. Mainstream scientific narratives position Columbus as a hero, and this fact becomes the basis for education and political policies in North centric understandings. The point that decolonial and southern perspectives bring to our notice is that holding on to multiple conflicting truths 
to determine a hero or criminal positionality is not just a matter of perspectives. We need a major and minor single door to trouble a naturalized universal thinking if we are to respond to this or other naturalized truths. Seeing then no build on multiversal thinking, the deployment of a mobile gaze and global centric in contrast to north or south centric points of departure. In parallel, and drawing inspiration from memory studies, we can also see how collective remembering props our understandings of the nature of science. Michael Rothberg suggests that collective remembering is, and I quote, memory that may be initiated by individuals that is mediated through networks of communications, institutions of the state and social groupings, end quote. Our universities, our disciplines, including what we call multidisciplinary areas, make up such groupings. Early and its seeks are such communities. Jim Wurch pushes us further by suggesting that collective remembering needs to be understood, and I quote, more as a site of active contestation and negotiation than as a means of accurately representing the past. Collective remembering involves some identity project, remembering in the service of what kind of people we are, end quote. Such remembering relates in central ways to how we label things, that is our scholarly vocabularies, when we position individuals like Petri Makanen, or create boundaries and directions on a spherical moving planet, or our labels for human conduct. I will now draw attention to recent analytical shifts in the language sciences and identity-related scholarship that draw on such global-centric framings and that have relevance for revitalizing the education sciences. I draw from my theoretical and empirical engagement in these front lines through the research projects, national research schools, and national school development projects that I have led primarily in Sweden, but also in southern territories since the 1990s. My aim here is to illustrate how the scholarship in the educational sciences has unwittingly outsourced many of its critical agendas to concepts that build on universalizations. It is this default outsourcing and collective remembering that is in need of decentering through a curiosity-driven multiversal ethos. Frontline scholarship in the language sciences has recently witnessed important shifts regarding the concept language. Unpacking fixed understandings of the thing we call language, scholars like Ruth Finnegan, Roy Harris and others explicitly question whether language exists and where it can be found. Of relevance to these shifts is the elaborations of mundane human languaging in southern epistemologies from territories where what we call multilingualism is the norm. Following this, naming traditions regarding what is a specific language and how it differs from another language have become increasingly relevant. Today, boundaries between named languages are accepted as being fuzzy and ideological. Language is understood as people's ways of being with words. While this frontline work is unevenly present in established and emerging areas of the language sciences, these developments can be understood as a shift from a noun that fixates and recreates boundaries to a verb that focuses on the sociality of human existence. Such analytical shifts have particular relevance to migrations in northern territories and the education of children and adults who we frame as multilingual and multicultural. Drawing on Stephen May's introduction to his 2014 edited volume, The Multilingual Turn, the point is whether it is 21st century migrations into European territories that have given rise to labels like super and hyperdiversity, and whether these have only recently started becoming multilingual and multicultural, or where the scholars in northern hegemonic cemeteries have started seeing, hearing, and recognizing the normal banality of these dimensions of the human condition now. 
outsourced, taken for granted all the terms like first language, second language, L1, L2, bilingual, code switching, and newer terms like plurilingual, metrolingual, urban contacts dialects, translanguage, etc., live rich lives in our mainstream scholarship. Such terms build on bounded imaginaries of language ontologies and what we understand as valid knowledge. Thus, what is Danish is not Dutch, what is English is not French, what is Swedish is not Swedish sign language, etc. The outsourcing in such mainstream vocabularies build on the imaginary that what is named language one is not named language two. A corollary to this does not mean that human beings can individually understand and use all human languages. I emphasize this even though with apps like Translate, Speak, Text, Crippling, and others, we can in principle navigate spoken and written named language spaces and images without individually knowing them and without the assistance of others inhabiting those spaces. So even though contemporary technologies enable such meaning making, that is not the point here. The specter of nation-state hegemonies in the education of sciences is another illustration of the outsourcing of our thinking to universalism. The unspoken premise of geographical determinism continues to build on and leads to imaginaries of nation states, peoples, and their behaviors in a linear developmental ladder. How, when, why, and by whom nation state related vocabularies are used needs analytical attention, not least in contemporary digital existence on the one hand and neo nationalistic waves on the other. What does it mean to be Norwegian, or British, or Greek? that is belongings to bounded geopolitical territories in contemporary times. Returning to my opening illustration, why is Petri Mekanen's Finnish ancestry not deemed relevant, and how did he morph into being Swedish? Directing my query to us scholars, why do we fixate children and young people's positionalities, seemingly for eternity, into migrant boxes in the 21st century, despite the fact that they are born in those spaces? What theoretical framings allow us to deploy constructs like second and third generation immigrants or other migrant related proxies in our research? What theoretical framings do we draw upon to differentiate people into either or positionalities, for instance, Sami and Norwegian or Sami and Swedish? When there's someone who can claim an indigenous status of Sami and lives in Norway or Sweden become Norwegian or Swedish? What sense do we make of Danishness when the Kingdom of Denmark continues to hold on to territories of Greenland that are located nearly 3,000 kilometers away in, other plan in another part of the planet? How are people whose parents and grandparents use multiple named languages positioned by scholars? Does Finnish as an L1 hold if a person has one parent who grew up in Finland and another who grew up in the nation state of Argentina and the family lives in Swedish territories? Those queries point to a monolingual, monomodal bias that is compounded by a mono-ethnic nation-state imaginary that continues to frame much education sciences scholarship. This is what I have drawn our attention to in this part of my talk. The interesting analysis of constant emergent becomings in our scholarship is thus intention with the fixed and bounded flagging of our research participants' nation-state allegiances and their communicative repertoires. An underlying concern is how such outsourcing shapes the validity of our analytical and methodological framings. What do people's or their ancestors' passports say about the mundane micro-interaction analysis that some of our educational research builds on? What constitutes urban languaging or super diversity languaging, digital analog entangled languaging, and on what basis and who has the authority to separate language codes in our contemporary existence. The point here is that our scholarly work itself is complicit in the reiteration of territorial and language borders. 
Vocabularies that align with the complexities of human meaning making are cross-entangled analog digital settings and recognize the normality of multilingualism and multimodality include normal languaging, bilingual medium, primary languages, secondary languages, language constellations, chaining, to name a few. Thus, center staging what it means to be human from multiversal thinking draws attention to how we label things, including who is to own this labeling. Drawing from a connected history, a global centric mobile gaze tr troubles the imaginaries of European one nation, one language, one people construct that continues to flourish not only in its contemporary territories, but that it has succeeded in exporting to its former colonies as well. The business practices outsourcing services or job functions to a third party on a contract basis is what we have unwittingly done as scholars situated <coughs> within the education sciences. Thus normal languaging and normal diversities continue to be outsourced to a universalizing conceptual toolbox that is mythical. Let me further illustrate these points to the school landscape of Sweden and by how languaging gets marked more generally. No schools in Sweden are monolingual. Swedish. Not least because English is a compulsory school language and pupils are required to study what we call a foreign language. In the Swedish context, these are German, French, and Spanish. While few use these named languages outside school in contemporary Sweden, nearly 200 so called home languages or mother tongues are used in private spheres, in market spaces, in playgrounds, in interpreted settings across arenas in media, in mother tongue allocated spaces in schools. Sweden's five ratified minority languages are also maintained in schools for pupils who can make a biologically defined claim to one of them. Interestingly, many children who attend these designated schools do not use these named languages in their private spheres. Furthermore, audiologically deaf children, 95% of whom come from homes where Swedish Sign Language has never existed, have access to five regional schools where they can get an education through Swedish Sign Language and Swedish. Ironically though, hearing children of deaf adults, hearing siblings of deaf siblings, who do use Swedish Sign Language in their private spheres, are denied an education in their primary language in these five schools. This means that it is the condition of deafness that it gives pupils access to education in Swedish Sign Language. Among some of issues, what we can infer from this brief overview is the multiplicity of language and repertoires of young people and the rich pupil demographics in schools in Sweden. However, the teacher demographics is highly skewed. It is primarily made up of a white, able-bodied, middle-class female population. This means that despite the rich languaging and diversity that marks pupils, these are not matched by school teachers or faculty in teacher education in an adequate manner. Schools where only white, majoritized pupils and teachers are members are rarely discussed in the scholarship or in the popular imagination when segregation and integration are on the agenda. Instead, schools with a rich pupil diversity are framed as being segregated. This means that multilingualism, multiculturalism and diversity become naturalized as the not normal human condition. While the monolingual, monocultural, white pupil and teacher positionality becomes the taken for granted norm. Caring for complexities here requires major and minor syndrome Using a mobile gaze and a global centric ethos here opens up for meeting complexities with schools and in teacher education in unexpected ways, enabling new research questions to emerge. And how our vocabularies have become outsourced and fossilized can also be seen in other ways. Here is a short video in Norwegian that is subtitled in English. This parody highlights a mainstream way of envisaging the evolution of reading and literacy tools like parchment, scrolls, physical books, and digital screens.
Ja, 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 så den jag fick ju någonting i hela formeln. Ja, jag är beklagad att det tar ni och så skulle vi hålla på lägga om till ett helt grejt system och då ska hålla ut på en gång. Ja, så vi tar mycket in i den. Men vad ligger där? Typ vet, har du försökt att öppna den? Ja, öppna den. Altså, hvis det hadde vært så enkelt så hadde jeg jo ikke tilkalt helpdesk, hadde jeg vel? Nei, det er det. Nei, nei. Du har visst på en fan? Nei, da skal jeg fort holde den. Ja, se. Jeg vil bare gjøre det. Nei. Så, ja, da er vi i gang. Ja, til så langt kom jeg også. Ok. Men så stoppet det opp, og så var jeg redd for at noe av teksten skulle forsvinne, så jeg turte ikke å gå videre. Å ja, ok. Nei, men du skjønner at inni her, så ligger det kanskje flere hundre sider med lavere tekst. Så for å komme videre, så tar du tak i et av et ark, på en måte her, og så blar du over på neste side sånn. Da fortsetter teksten der. Jeg blar altså? Du blar, ja. Men når jeg skal tilbake da? Nei, da bare blar du tilbake igjen på tak der. Altså, er det sånn? Da er det. Så er vi tilbake til den teksten, har du sånn, ikke noe... Ok, så slutter du her, og så... Så fortsetter den der, ja! Ok, men når jeg skal avslutte, da er det noe jo da. Da bare slår du sammen permene. Ja. På den måten der. Så, da er det lukket der, ligger alt lager ut i det der. Altså, jeg risikerer ikke å miste noe av teksten her. Nei, alt ligger lager ut i det der, ja. I tilfellet vi setter fyr på her, da vil jeg gjøre litt sånn svinger. Ja, ok. Nei, men for det er noe av det at du har holdt på med skriftruller. Ja. Så tar du litt grann med tid å konvertere til å bla i en bøk. Ja. Ja, det er ok. Hva er greit? Ja, men du, jeg tenker vel før du går. Men du må jo gå igjen en gang til. Så jeg åpner. Ja. Sånn. Jeg vet ikke. Og så, hva har du kalt det? Blar. Jeg blar. Ja, blar vi det. Blar frem og tilbake. Og når jeg ligger der helt ut. Ja. Og når jeg er ferdig, så bare lukker jeg den. Nei. Flott. Hitt deg. Kjempefint. Ja, men du. Nei, nei, nei. Ikke sant? Nå er den sånn igjen. Nå får jeg ikke åpne den. Nå er det sånn her. Nå får jeg ikke åpne den. Nei, jeg får ikke sitt. Du må gå opp med å åpne fra den andre siden. Så det er ikke like jubbig det, altså. Å åpne fra den siden der. Sånn. Der. Der nå. Ja, vel. Har du mye rekord? Manualen, eller? Manualen. Jeg skal følge med som manualen, så bruker vi verdelig den kritikken der. Å, vet du. Å, ja. I den, ja. Det er alt sammen. Ja. Ja, men det er ikke at det er noe samme problemet. Får den ikke opp. Jeg tror jeg skulle ha tenkt på. Jeg tror jeg skulle ha tenkt på. By the time of us were born in the era of books, others were born in the era of screens. The shifts marked in this video highlight differences and similarities between time spaces, literacy tools, social practices, and so on. However, these shifts have only built upon a mainstream West Euro North America centric view of writing systems, where a left to right directionality is deployed. Major world languages like Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, Arabic were written in contrast from right to left. Thus, other knowledge regimes and their trajectories are not attended to in this illustration. A right-to-left logic is retained in the translation of manga campaigns created for North-centric readers. From our mainstream gaze, we label this reading logic back to front, even when the script is Latin and not Arabic, or the Jewish katva ashubi, or a global graphic system. Chinese and Japanese use yet another writing logic, the tatigaki, top to bottom inscriptions that start on the right and proceed to the left. The salient issue is that humanity has many ways with words and many ways of being. Far from being more advanced or superior to other ways of words, what is in need of acknowledgement is the many ways with words that have existed and still exist. It is these that have been marginalized or erased from our North-centric single grand narratives. In addition to being acknowledged, these need to be brought into dialogue with our mainstream knowledge regimes. We are accustomed to regularly outsourcing aspects of our academic work to others, to administer resources, book meeting rules, and travel publish our manuscripts. However, when we fail to recognize the banal but serious outsourcing that is taking place in relation to key concepts, then we are in deep waters. 
While mainstream non-nutrition is advocating increasing critique, much needed hope exists in transcending universalizing tendencies. In the final part of my talk, I summarize and turn towards hopeful futures by offering five interrelated sinlendor that deflect in major and minor ways from our mainstream thinking. There is always a particular epistemological framing that is considered more relevant or correct in scholarly collective remembering. I have flagged for caring for complexities as a key endeavor in the craft of the social scientist. Given that the basic premise of post-structuralism is that it is impossible to accurately represent the world, our ways of conceptualizing key issues of significance to our contemporary challenges needs to shed the paradoxically created hegemonic universalizing truths. Transcending mainstream biases and bringing connected history center stage serves here to inform from global-centric multiversality rather than from global universalisms. Even where contestations are acknowledged, they often have a rhetorical nature, and more seriously, they continue to be done within West Euro or North American-centric framings. The point that the decolonization of the mind scholarship highlights is the need to acknowledge the images of other knowledge production genealogies, other ways of thinking that are equally, if not more important for humanity and its challenges. Using a spider's web metaphor enables using a mobile gaze across multiversal epistemologies. This is the point of thinking dynamically. Two, undisciplinarity pushes for cross-sectorial collaborations in exploring a range of areas of interest to the educational sciences. Innovativeness in terms of jugad thinking focuses on unconventional strategies for resolving new and old challenges. Undisciplinarity and jugad thinking constitute a major agenda that can reverse the counterproductive consequences of the outsourcing of our reasoning to naturalized conceptualizations that mark and fixate nation states, groups, ideas, and disciplines. The unpredictability of undisciplinarity and jugad thinking allows for posing novel questions that have a chance of tackling problems of equity and learning in society and in our research. Mobile gazing is an analytical term that aligns with an undisciplinary engagement with jugad. Transcending straight-jacketed theories and methods calls for jugad thinking, which furthermore encourages us to go beyond our mainstream single project reporting. In mainstream scholarship, projects risk becoming ends in themselves, rather than a means to further our connected historical thinking. Scrutinizing reading lists that we use in higher education and probably not centric scholarship are important ways to decolonize our curricula. However, making changes to course readings can only cosmetically address the issues I have raised today. This is similar to what Tommaso Milani highlights as a cure for diversifying the higher education <coughs> faculties in Swedish territories. Pointing to the white homogeneity of university boards and leadership strata, Milani calls for bringing in color to these spaces. Widening faculty demographics is important. Perhaps a minor silvenda that risks becoming a tick mark tokenistic endeavor. A major silvenda calls for confronting the single grand narratives that continue to frame important agendas, in addition to widening leadership positionalities in educational institutions, including in research. Here, fundamental shifts are needed to attend to the very constructions of what we believe are universal truths. This is an important way to bring back humanism into the scholarship, into teacher education, and in school institutions. Three, I have argued that the meta-language and labels we take for granted in the education sciences need scrutiny. The names we use for places, people, things, and ideas are validated, not neutral. In addition to being reinforced, they erase other ontologies and epistemologies through our universalistic thinking. 
While scholars within the education sciences have actively engaged with neoliberal issues, we rarely, if ever, connect neoliberalism to neocolonialism. Economical framings constitute coloni colonialization of thinking in terms of correctness, correctness of theories of how the social order is constituted and how it should be upheld, how development and history are thought of, correctness in terms of what learning is, how learning should be measured, etc. In attempts to break such compact thinking regarding the correct ways of understanding learning and instruction, it has even been suggested that we should stop talking about learning altogether and replace it with other labels. While sympathetic to the underlying rationale for such cause, there are risks in forbidding and replacing a key term like learning with proxies. Taking multiversality as points of departure instead opens for more curiosity to the creative stances, including populating the complexities of learning with dynamic content from other epistemologies. Our strive for equity through the areas of integration and inclusion can illustrate the issue of neighborability too. Integration and inclusion are aligned historically to migration on the one hand and disability positionalities on the other. Despite concerted efforts, we continue to live in societies that are far from equitable. Multiversal thinking instead offers both a democratic fabric that enables different positions to come into contact and to coexist, and new ways of framing integration and inclusion, opening for hopeful futures. This means that we need to understand communication. For instance, the labels we use for language, culture, for instance, the labels we use for people's habits and traditions and diversity, that is labels we use for individual and collective identity positions. Through non-mainstream lives, other years, different taste buds and multiple colored skins, if you like. This is the meaning of attending to contemporary challenges through other ontologies and epistemologies. This third thing then that calls for cultivating an analytical sensitivity towards meaning practices in the education of sciences. Four, the ethos of the Sinland of undisciplinarity and nameability also relates centrally to positionality. Here, the what's, how's, why's, and the who's that we focus upon are particularly augmented by the who that is doing this scholarly work, that is you and me. Transcending territorially fixed affiliation is a place of birth or parent or previous citizenship or biological genealogy or employment to locate a human being or scholar for eternity, it is the mobile human condition in analog digital time spaces that is relevant here. Mobility shapes scholars' lives and academic trajectories. It frames our gazing possibilities and its potential multidirectionality through our very living and working in digital analog entanglements. Popular stances of locating people into categories a priori go against the dynamic complexity of the human condition. This can be noted through convergent framings regarding positionality in Ubuntu, numerous indigenous philosophies, and northern scholars like Tim Inbond, who highlights, and I quote, peoples, other living creatures, and non-beats becoming is continually overtaking their being end quote. Interdependence and interbeing are key dimensions related to the singletta of positionality. While some scholars have positionalities that are marginal, cultivating marginality is a critical strategy for those scholars who have privileged positionalities, as the white, heterosexual, male, middle-class, able-bodied scholar Stefan Zweifosch highlights. The bottom line is, and can be articulated in desiring Lewis and Gabriel Barbadero's words. What kind of knowledge matters is linked to the question whose knowledge matters. The final thing then that I draw our attention to for epistemic sustainability relates to ethicality. Doing science sustainably requires rethinking our assumptions to trouble the givens. Ethics in scholarship goes beyond formal requirements of obtaining clearance from research committees. Acknowledgement of sources, acknowledgement of inputs by other scholars, particularly <coughs> the contributions across time spaces of marginalized, minoritized scholars, 
constitutes key dimensions here. Ethicality also involves expanding one's own referential repertoires. It calls for critical reflexive thinking of the mundane processes across the entire trajectory of planning, conducting and producing research. Herein lies the significance of an undisciplinary stance and on the edge positionality. Ethicality also involves inviting the gaze of marginally positioned researchers on issues of relevance for northern territories and northern thinking, rather than relegating them to positions of passivity or restricting their gaze to issues regarding their territories of birth or former citizenship or their functionality, social class, sexuality, etc. Working on relevant streams of scholarship that are significant to contemporary planetary challenges, as well as contributing to epistemic justice, are dimensions of ethicality that are critically important in the education and sciences. In conclusion, it is meeting complexity head-on that can revitalize the education and sciences. It is a creative, curiosity-driven science rather than a conformity ethos that is needed to meet societal and research challenges. Using the popular Zen illustration of the fruitlessness of filling a cup or a bag that is already full requires two things. One, to empty some of its contents before trying to fill it with new ideas, and two, to move out of one's comfort zone by exposing oneself to new contexts and ideas that challenge in way to take for granted ones. Embracing the major and minor seen when the writer illustrated here can be crucial to stepping out of the de facto monodisciplinary silos, cultivating an at the edge stance that can safeguard us from fixed, blinding, blind spots of mainstream centers. This is needed to democratize and contribute to epistemic sustainability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sangeeta, for this very rich and uh, thought-provoking uh, invited address. Uh, it was very interesting to hear where you are now in your work. So now we have time for questions. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta, for a really inspiring and thought-provoking uh, talk uh, with so many rich examples that really brings home the point. One of your rich examples was the, the, uh, the IT help desk that I have laughed about and I've, my tears ran down, <laughs> um, and when I laughed the when I saw it the first time, and they still do, I find it really funny, and I find it really funny because it helps me in my local environment to speak nicer to the IT health people oh, yeah. in my local context because I realize how arrogant I could be. I hope I'm not, but uh, how arrogantly I could ask my questions, trying to uh, hide my uh, vulnerability and not mastering this new technology. Mm -hmm. It also, I think, helps uh, help desks see where maybe they should be a bit more creative than giving another kind of the same system. So I think in my local context, that really helps to get, give sin vendors that are not in the global sense that you're talking about, but actually helps us see the other point and see it from the other side. So. And, but putting put in this context, of course it makes me, of course I agree that it, this is only one Western aspect. So my question to you is, to, way, um, to which extent is the global centric uh, aspect or perspective that you're providing us with the perspective we should see everything under, and to which extent it is, is it a perspective that makes, uh, that is relevant uh, in some contexts more than others? Uh, thanks, Nina. Um, yes, uh, I think if I rephrase your um, question, what you're trying to get to is that how is the illustration, and then when I went on to talk about that this is a particular way of understanding languaging, uh, <coughs> and I use the uh, illustration of uh, written languaging from other epistemologists, we have generally tended to in literacy studies or new literacy studies of, uh, as they're afraid to differ to the world, uh, we generally looked at this in a developmental, uh, that, that there is a trajectory of genealogy that you know, the, we remember better, so in particular writing systems have particular restrictions. 
So my point here is to, instead of taking that as some kind of a grand narrative, to look at the many different ways of um, written languaging and meaning making that uh, different collectives have come up with. And this has consequences then for our nation state communities to be able to attend to the diversities that we have, that we are now recognizing, but had existed earlier on. So that is the point that I was trying to draw my, uh, our attention to, uh, using that uh, uh, video clip, which is worth looking at a number of times, because there are so many layers you know, uh, to, to our present day concerns. So, so the point being, so if you, if you have uh, Hebrew or if you have Arabic as your primary, one of your primary languages, uh, then our teachers, our researchers are completely um, not conscious of this richness. So we are the ones who need to educate ourselves about other systems and not in a linear developmental manner. That argument can be made, but that argument seems to be the only one that exists. So, you know, we are societally superior. Our ways of writing are superior. So that, that is the uh, problem that we generate ourselves. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? I can. My name is uh, Nevin Sirwa, the uh, University of Update. Uh, thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, inspiring record talk. I was just wondering um, if you um, want to reflect a bit um, um, on how um, post-modal perspectives on um, the global style framework can have implications in terms of how we think about voice and literacy. Um, the reason I ask that is because in my PhD, I work, I work with children's citizenship, so there were children in school. Um, and trying to sort of work around how um, perspectives that you presented to us today can challenge our often quite narrowly thinking about participation. Um, often, sort of, you talk about animal body, and we think about speech and reason. And I was just wondering whether you would say something about some more embodied forms of how we think around um, agency and what is literally those kind of things. Thank you. You're using voice and embodiment as points of departure, and you now need more illustrations of this way of thinking. So what, one of the examples, and I hope that that is clear, is the, is the issue that there is this mismatch between the demographics of pupils in our uh, school system and the teachers in the school system and then teacher trainers in the school system. So that this is a layered issue and of course then we could go on to researchers. Um, so that is one very important issue that we need to discuss. My point is not that we now need to you know, really change things, but the point is that that is a stumbling block that we don't even allow ourselves to dialogue on. So that is one. Uh, the reason I don't use voice is because it seems to have become everything, but the other is my work in deaf studies, where visuality is very important. And, and of course, then there is that issue of that, you know, how do you deal with blind, you know, the, the embodiment from, from that angle. But the mobile gaze is then, it becomes an important analytical construct to help us understand uh, how we can uh, move ahead and here, I think, I mean, uh, when you say children, you know, school children and adults, and we already have that embodied differentiation in, in terms of our sizes, uh, and a lot has been written about how to kind of understand that gap. And I think it is incorrect to then say that you know adults cannot research children, which which is also something we see in the interpretation. So. In gender studies, where my chair has been located, we then see that men should uh, research violence and women should research women. Which, you know, so we can draw this to an absurd situation that only some human embodied researchers can study other human embodied states. So there is need to keep that in mind, but there is also need to deconstruct that and see the problem, because that is we're not coming analytically for that. 
So this issue of agency then could be, it, I think it could be helped through intersectional scholarship. Uh, so we have this um, uh, statement of, uh, you know, uh, what is the other question? So a scholar called Marie Masunda takes this up and, and, and my <coughs> reading of her work is that if you're interested in gender, start interesting yourself. Look at the same questions in the area of class. If you're interested in, in disability, start looking at another area. Don't let go of your area, but start. And that mobility, that gaze, is shift in pace, is going to allow you to interrogate your own biases, your own analytical biases. I don't know if that so, so looking at agency kind of better. So I'm going to open up for Billy Bestial, but thank you so much for a very cultural uh, uh, presentation and, uh, and many questions raised. But I wanted to ask you about the, uh, you presented the concept of existential sustainability. And that got me thinking, like, how do you see it relates to the reason every sort of on, like, responsible science and all kinds of beverages for sustainability? And what should we be teaching in, in higher education? Or how should we? as the, you know, administrators in the university as well. How should we approach this? What should we translate it to in our own practices and in the things that we teach to our students? Very much issue. But uh, thank you for raising it, because I think that is a way to start having discussion. So what about, I mean, to, to the previous uh, question, you know, okay. Is it, is it just teacher education that has its responsibility? You know, schools get bashed, that schools are the institution in society, that uh, in, in uh, democratically framed societies that have all, everyone is supposed to attend. So schools are the problem, but that is uh, simplification as we all hopefully know. So what should we be teaching? So again, I would then interrogate who is the we, start there. We, in, in Sweden, we are very, very, we, we talk about gender, that's it, full stop. We, we don't talk about any other categories. In our research, we are not allowed to um, do work where we are identifying and categorizing. And that's another ditch that we could fall into. But not being allowed to do research is, is a very serious problem. So raising these kinds of issues from our own experiences as researchers, we should then start the interrogation about who is the we who wants to do the what. And these are not issues that one person can take on, but these are issues that we need to collectively discuss. Uh, a few years ago, there was this big discussion about how, uh, at least in, in the local communities I am a member of, both in research and outside of research, that it is so problematic that uh, South American nation states do not recognize the needs to have uh, humanities lungs in shape. And that is such a ahistorical understanding of both colonialism and how we have destroyed those territories, but also what we are doing now. So I don't think that there is a simple answer, and I would welcome suggestions from anyone else who has. But, but here are some very simple ways of starting the conversation. Well, we, I think we have to stop. It's 11.15, and uh, we should keep the time. Uh, so I'm uh, very, very happy that we've been able to listen to you, and we would like to, on behalf, I would like to, on behalf of the early community, to uh, offer you a token of appreciation. Well, 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 thank you for that.